Well, in some ways, it feels like just an ordinary day of the week. But if you consider the profoundness of what God did in that first Christmas two millennia ago, it really is a mystery that is beyond our ability to grasp. And it sets it apart as a day of celebration, as a holy night, as we just heard sung for us. It is a special, extraordinary time for us who believe that God was willing to come down and enter our human existence. How many of you ladies have had the privilege or the labor of bringing a child into the world? Okay. How many of you thought your pregnancy was just too short? You know, if you just could have had 12 months, that would have been great. How many of you husbands who were sharing life with your beloved couldn't wait for them to deliver either? Thank you. Hope you like the couch. It's a good place. You know, this was a pregnancy, the pregnancy of Jesus that was in the works from the beginning of the Bible's recorded history, in the book of Genesis, the Lord said to the serpent who had beguiled Adam and Eve, you're going to crawl on your belly all your life, and someday a child born of the woman will crush your head, and you will bruise his heel. And that became the first promise of a child who would be born, who would reverse the fall, and who would be God's intervention into the world to save us from ourselves, from our selfishness, from our cantankerous rebellion. So there's a sense in which time has been pregnant with the promise of God since its beginning. The prophets foretold it. And year after year, decade after decade, century after century, they longed with hope for the day when Jesus would do exactly what he promised, which is come to be among us as Emmanuel, God with us. But I'm taken in the Christmas story this week, this year particularly, with the image of the angel. Now, through the history of art, Angels have been depicted in a whole variety of ways, usually chubby-cheeked, a little rose in the cheek, wings sprouting, maybe they're holding a bow and arrow, floating around. I'd rather imagine angels as like warriors of God that are the messengers of God radiating glory because they've just left the presence of the Almighty in the glory of heaven. And they've come on a mission to deliver a word from God. Watch the angels in the biblical narrative. Because when an angel is sent from God, a messenger to speak the word of God, then the word of God begins a creative force that impacts the created order to introduce something powerful that God is doing for good for his people. So you think of the story in the Old Testament of Abraham and Sarah who had waited 24 years for the promise of a son that would be born to Sarah who was barren. And three angels appear and Sarah laughs at the preposterousness that after all this time God would do what he had said. But sure enough, Isaac, he laughs, was born within a year. An angel kept Abraham from actually sacrificing Isaac. He passed the test. And then later, Jacob, who was running from his brother Esau after he swindled him from the porridge, saw this stairway to heaven that Led Zeppelin sang about, right? The stairway to heaven. With the angel of the Lord standing at the top, it's the connecting link between humanity and the Almighty and His glory and holiness where the Lord provides the way for us to be connected. Later, Jacob because he had swindled Esau, wrestled with his fears in the darkness of night with an angel of the Lord. 
and he begged God to bless him. Then there was Moses at the burning bush where the angel of the Lord delivered the message that he was to go and deliver the people. And it was the great exodus, the deliverance of the Old Testament, the saving event of the Old Testament. Every time an angel comes, something significant is going on in God's story, in God's narrative. So now you come to the New Testament story, the Christmas story, and Zechariah, who was a high priest, goes into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, and the angel Gabriel appears to Zechariah and says, your wife Elizabeth, who also, by the way, has been barren, is going to give birth to a son. He will be the forerunner to the Messiah. We know him as John the Baptist. And then the angel appeared to Mary, the one who was of the lineage of David's line, royalty, is going to be born to you, Mary, for you are favored by God. Joseph, so dismayed by the news, is going to put her away quietly, and then an angel appears to Joseph in a dream to tell Joseph that all of this is of God. It's the plan that God has orchestrated from the beginning of history when humanity fell away from God in rebellion. So when we say the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight, like the words in the lyric of the hymn, all of the created order and all the time of the promises of God and the hopeful waiting culminates in the birth of God's Son into the world. That's what makes the announcement of the Christmas story of the angels to the shepherds so amazing. That in all the places where God could have announced His birth, He did not announce it in the palace to the kings and the princes. He did not go to the military camps and announce it to the generals. He did not even go to the religious leaders, to the priests and the prophets, and say, hey, the one you've waited for for years is here. When God was going to make his birth announcement, it's a boy. He went to the least admired and least respected blue-collar boys of that culture, the shepherds out working the night shift with the sheep. Don't you imagine that those shepherds never forgot that night? Don't you imagine that for the rest of their life they couldn't get that vision, that visual out of their minds that an angel, a supernatural being from the presence of the living God had come to them to say, the Son of God is here. Don't be afraid. Good news, great joy. For you is born a Savior. Then notice, what did they say? You go find the baby. He'll be in a manger. And they did just that. Now, when you've had children born to your family or grandchildren, how did you announce that birth? Yeah, yeah, we had another baby. Great news! We had a baby! It's a boy! It's a girl! With great excitement for the precious gift of life that God has given, you announce the birth. I think that God announced it to the shepherds instead of the political regime because God wanted to know that the redemption of humanity was not going to come through human structures or human order or the ways of man. Leave it to God to redeem the world by putting an infant in the arms of a virgin girl and then growing the love of God for the whole world, bringing the world back to his heart through the life, death, and resurrection of that child. Isn't that an amazing story? I remember with each of the birth of our children, we have four, those of you who don't know the Lavigs, we have three girls and a boy. Our youngest was a boy. Somebody asked me when the boy was born, because he was the youngest, are you going to call him Twix? 
said, no, his name is Luke. But I remember we lived in little Hoople, North Dakota, and there was this marquee in the center of Hoople. And all it said when our son was born was, it's a boy. And then it said, Luke, Adam, Lave. Well, there was this one quick-witted jokester from my church who came up to me the next time he saw me. He said, Luke, Adam, Luke, Adam, Luke, Adam, Luke, Adam, Luke, Adam. I said, thanks for that. I'll never forget it. But here's what I want you to do this Christmas. Look to Adam. He's your baby. He's born for you. So that you would know the love of God. I want to tell you a story about a boy named Gunther. It's a true story from the country of Germany written by an author named Edna Hong, in a book called Bright Valley of Love. Gunther was born in 1914 in Germany, and he had a severe case of rickets. So his bones, by the disease, were curved and deformed and distorted in their shape. And so this little boy's body was grotesque in appearance. His father was off fighting a war. His mother just totally rejected him. So Grandma ended up raising Gunther. Only Grandma was totally embarrassed by her grandson, ashamed of him. So she kept him in the back room. She called him her little piece of junk. Come here, you little piece of junk. And Gunther couldn't speak. All he did was roll his head back and forth on his pillow saying, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna. One day when Grandma was out doing some shopping, some boys from the village where they lived broke into her home and went into the back room where Gunther lay, Grandma's little piece of junk, that human animal. And when Grandma found out that the boys had broken into her home, she was not angry at the boys. She was enraged because her shameful truth had been discovered. Her secret piece of junk was now known. She decided that very day to ship him off to a home for handicapped children in Germany called Bethel, which means house of God, to a house called Patmos. Amazing that when Gunther got there, they discovered he could learn to talk. He was not mentally handicapped. He was physically handicapped. And no one had even spent enough time in his presence to teach him to speak. His closest bedmate in his bedroom was a boy named Kirk. Kirk was very severely ill with epileptic seizures. So severe they were that they knew that Kirk was probably not going to live very long. And Pastor Fritz, who was the pastor who ran this home called Patmos, was very attentive to Kirk because he knew that he wasn't going to live long. But Kirk shared with Gunther about his parents. His father had died in the war, and his mother had died of illness not long afterwards. And Kirk began to share with Gunther how wonderful it was to be in a home where it was love that was shared. And the more Kirk talked about his parents, the more Gunther imagined that they were his parents too, his imaginary parents whom he'd never had because he'd never known love. And Kirk said, Gunther, Christmas is coming soon, and this Christmas I know I'm going to be in the Christmas room of heaven with my mommy and daddy. Gunther said, no, 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 Kirk. I want you to live here with me. Kirk said, no. I'll be in heaven by Christmas. The season of Advent came, and each day they had devotions in that home led by Pastor Fritz. 
Well, when the fourth Sunday of Advent came, because Pastor Fritz knew that Kirk was soon to die, he asked Kirk if he would light the candles. And just as Kirk was taking the flame and lighting the fourth Advent candle, he had a terrible epileptic seizure. And he fell to the ground and his body was shaking. And he knocked all the candles over. And all the children were wide-eyed and silent. And Gunther didn't know what was happening to his friend. He said, what is this Christmas anyway? What is it about? And after silence, a nurse came and swooped up Kirk and took him out of the room, and Pastor Fritz got the children to start singing another hymn of praise to God. And they no sooner started that hymn, but Gunther stepped up on top of something to get a little more height and yelled at the top of his lungs, everything's got a crack in it. And when he yelled it, the silence in the room was so loud, you could hear it. And then Gunther ran to Pastor Fritz and buried his head in Pastor Fritz's sweater and whispered, everything's got a crack in it. Well, Christmas came, and Pastor Fritz said, I'm going to tell you, children, the Christmas story, and because it's Kirk's last Christmas with us, I'm going to have him sit on my lap. And because it's Gunther's first Christmas with him, us, I'm going to have him sit on my other side of my lap. And he told them the Christmas story using figures from the manger crash, like I shared with the children. And the children were wide-eyed and basically told the whole story for Pastor Fritz. And then when the story was done, all the children started jumping up and down. And Gunther didn't know what was going on, but the rest of the children did because then one of the nurses brought their presents into the room and they all began to unwrap their presents. And Gunther didn't quite register that there was going to be a present for him. There was one for Monica repeatedly said, Gloria, Susanna, Gloria, Susanna. That was her way of saying, Gloria, Hosanna. Or a boy named Matthew who was trapped in numbers and kept repeating, 1225, 1225, 1225, 1225. Or a little boy, Bobby, who had a 30-year-old body but a 5-year-old mind who kept saying, baby Jesus, birth, baby Jesus, baby Jesus. And a girl named Lenny, who said, Christmas is special. She was blind, eight years old. But it was like she had a revelation moment. Christmas is special, because everything has a crack in it. Gunther unwrapped his present. A train. He couldn't believe that this present was for him. Pastor Fritz said, well, that is what Christmas is about. God has given you a gift, Gunther, and the gift is his son. So we give gifts to show the same love that God gives to us. And then Gunther remembered Kirk. Kirk, Kirk! He ran to the next room where Kirk was laying in a bed and saw that Kirk had been given a little statue of the Madonna holding the baby. And he stroked the head of the woman, Mary, and said, she looks just like my mommy. The next day was Christmas morning. And a nurse rolled Kirk into the room where the children were playing and said, boys and girls, Kirk wants to say goodbye. And so one at a time, the the children came and shook hands with Kirk or touched Kirk and said goodbye. And Gunther touched little Kirk and said, please tell Mommy and Daddy hello for me. And then Kirk was taken away, and they continued their play. 
About an hour later, Pastor Fritz came back and said Kirk had died. And Gunther began to cry for the first time in his life, weep. His body, his shoulders shook because the only friend he'd ever had on the face of the planet had died. And he ran to Pastor Fritz and he said it again. Everything's got a crack in it. Everything's got a crack in it. And Pastor Fritz said, and that's why Jesus was born at Christmas. Because God, who understands just how broken and cracked and flawed our world is, sent Jesus in his love to bridge the gap, to fill the crack, and in fact to restore and recreate all things. That's why he came for you, Gunther, and for every one of you. It's a profound story because I find myself in the story. I read news from the world headlines and I think about the death of precious ones in my family. And I think about people that I visited even in this Christmas season who are so depressed and blue because of brokenness in their lives or grief or regret or sense of powerlessness to change the dynamics of their life and they want to make it better or they want to fix it, but they can't fix it. And in their own way, as they unburden themselves about what's going on in their life, it's like they're shouting with Gunther, everything has a crack in it. So I don't know what's broken in your life. I don't know where you have regret. I don't know where you carry guilt or shame. I don't know where you feel powerless. I don't know where your dreams have died or your hopes feel like they've dissipated like the morning dew. But I do know this, that the angel says the word of God is God has come because his favor is for you. And the baby is born for you. So wherever you're broken, you with the shepherds can go find the baby. Take him home. God is saying, we're at peace. Through Jesus, I've reconciled you to myself. Will you receive the love that I have for you in Jesus? Do you believe the peace that I want to give you in Jesus? Can you experience the joy that comes because you are mine. Because Jesus was born for you. It's an awesome day, the celebration of the birth of the Son of God. The angel's message is true for us. Glory to God. Peace among all God's people.